Okay, we're happy to have Coach Smart. He will go straight to questions. We'll start in the back on the right. Dan Peck, ESPN 1067 in Auburn. Coach, it's your uh, first year in the SEC without Coach Saban after his retirement. I'm curious about your relationship with uh, with Coach Saban. Have you, have you reached out to him much after he's uh, stepped down? And, and also, does it, does it feel different going into this league uh, this season with uh, well, with a new head coach at Alabama? No, I, ha- I have a great relationship with Coach Saban. And as I referenced in the uh, big room, I, have, I pay so much respect uh, and so much uh, – I, you know, just credit to um, what I learned because people forget that it wasn't the nine years at Alabama. It was the one year at LSU and the one year at the Dolphins. So to have 11 years to work for what is the GOAT, he is the greatest of all time in my opinion, and it's not really close because of the, the time in which he did it. Uh, it was a lot of um, – what's the right word um, – it was a very competitive environment. It was not like a single team dominance, and he dominated for a long time. So we have a great relationship. Uh, obviously, we communicate more now uh, than we did in the past as we were competitors, but there's always been a mutual respect and uh, a lot of appreciation, and probably more now seeing him you know, at the ESPYs and seeing him on TV and seeing the things he's doing to give back and be the torchbearer. I just have a lot of respect for him. Left side, third row. Coach Daryl Dapperich with the Locked On Network. Um, kind of give us a little insight as to the process on how maybe a homecoming opponent is selected. Obviously, there's been a little bit of a firestorm with Auburn, the deepest, oldest South's rivalry being your homecoming opponent from the Auburn side. Kind of wanted to get a little bit of a peel back the curtain on how that process and how you choose your homecoming opponents. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> like, I don't I, – I get the schedule just like everybody does. And, uh, I mean, other than, you know, your non-conference games, I mean, you, you have to go try to schedule those out 10 years in advance, which is uh, an impossible hurdle. But I had no idea that that was even the case. So, when you say peel back the curtain – uh, I have no idea how that's selected or, or what goes into it. Right side on the end. Hey, Coach. Michael Brauner, WNSP in Mobile. The AJC report said that there were 24 driving-related arrests and incidents surrounding Georgia football since that January 2023 tragedy. Why does this keep happening, and what are you specifically doing to address it? Yeah, I think the number one thing is disappointed. You know, anytime you have a situation like that, uh, you want your – kids your players to make better decisions and uh and i always say you you can't be outcome related and i'm very disappointed in the outcomes but i am very pleased with our process we've put in uh in terms of education uh driver safety requiring defensive driving uh education talking about it having leaders stand up and talk about it bringing speakers in and talk about it suspending players dismissing players which we've done i don't know to this point any coach in college football that suspended a player for a driving citation we have we have and we've also dismissed players based on uh driving citations nobody's done that so uh, hopefully they get the, the idea and the information. But we have a really good locker room, and I feel really good about that. Like, I love the players we have. I love the, the, the locker room we have. We have good kids. We got 45 kids yesterday playing, battling a uh, breast cancer golf tournament to raise money. So we, we, we got kids that go to Camp Sunshine, the entire team, and do a lot of good things, but uh, not representative of what we want when they make mistakes like that. Left side, fourth row. Hey, Coach. Ben Boba, Global 3 News in Chattanooga. Cole Spear is someone that's been in your program for a few years. When Malachi was in here, he sort of perked up when I brought him up just how, how much of a leader he's grown into. And he talked about how excited he is to see the role he's going to step into for the team this year. How is, have you seen him grown into that leader? And what is that role maybe this year that you foresee him stepping into? He's just such a hard worker. Everybody loves Cole. I mean, he's, he's – uh, first of all, he's tough. He's physical. He plays on special teams. You know, he might not be the most dominant wide out. He's not a guy that's just going to win off the line every time. But he, he gives you great work ethic day in and day out. He holds the standard high in that room. He started contributing more and more on special teams last year. He's been able to stay healthy. You know, he's had some hamstring issues. He's a really fast uh, guy. And he, that's his weapon on special teams is his speed. But I, I love working with Cole. He's another great example of we talk about our locker room. I love our locker room. I love the culture we have of our kids. And he's, he's indicative of that. Right side, front row, and then pass the mic to the aisle, please. Coach, uh, Steve Moulton, WZZN in Huntsville, Alabama. Coming out of spring, 
Uh, what do you like most about this team in particular, and what's your biggest question heading into the fall? Oh, I don't know, Steve. I, coming out of spring, I loved the practice environment, the competitive nature between the offense and defense, the battles we had on the field. Like the, the practices were very spirited, it seemed like. And uh, I enjoy that. I think when you have good spirited practices, they get more out of them, and it doesn't feel like this mundane, boring work. So I really like that. Uh, as far as areas we got to work on, I mean, the depth of the defensive line, I don't think anybody in the country will tell you they got enough depth. I don't think we have enough depth. Um, we don't have a great depth at offensive line. We're years past. We were probably two and three deep. Right now, we have a very experienced offensive line, but we don't have a deep offensive line. So uh, some of that's been attrition. Some of that's been portal. You, you, you have to continue to create depth because you don't know when it's going to glare its head within the season. Second row on the right. Shahan J. Roger from CBS Sports. Uh, Coach, I was amused a little by your, your NIL joke out there. I'm curious, what's kind of the state in your mind of NIL at Georgia? I, you lost me there in the beginning. You said my NIL what? Uh, the joke about Nike and, and Dan Lanning. Oh, yeah, about yeah. Dan Lanning having the, 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 the treasure chest to open yeah. up and get whatever he wants. Yeah, but what, what was your question directly? About? Yeah, I'm curious about your thoughts on the state of NIL at Georgia right now. I think it's in a good place. I mean, our kids are competitive, and, and you know, we, we, we are different than most. We have a, a system that, that is, we believe, you come in and you work your way up. You don't come in and make more money than starters. And philosophically, we stand by that. And if that costs us a player, we think we win in culture because we don't want players that feel like, there's an entitlement for a freshman coming in. And I think a lot of schools made that mistake early on, three, four years ago, and you could have some upset locker rooms. We're going to err on the side of you earn what you get, and the more you stay and play and contribute, the more opportunity you get at NIL, and that's kind of the state of our NIL. We'll go to the aisle here in the second row. Hey, Coach, Jonathan Hoppy with WTVM in Columbus. You mentioned Michael Williams and his versatility. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you see from him and maybe a different role in the defense this year, and, and what do you think he can bring in that new role? Well, he's very versatile. He's very talented. He played defensive end, which would be a five technique, nine technique, six technique, four eye, all that for us last year. He'll continue to do that. We think he gives us the versatility to go outside and set edges um, and, and create plays. We've got more depth now at some spots inside that we can bump him out. Um, he's athletic enough to play and stand up, um, but he's also big enough to go and battle and, and, and fit up on some big tackles. So uh, we're lucky to have him. We need more guys like him, but better than anything he does on the field is his work ethic off the field and what he stands for. I, I, I enjoy having Michael around and, and what he brings to our team. We'll go here on the front row. Spencer McLaughlin, Locked On Podcast Network. Talk about Carson Beck. Had a great season a year ago, but where do you feel he can, if at all, still improve going into year two as a starter in this offensive system? Well, his approach to, to watching tape, finding out what defenses do, knowing what they're doing before it happens, the approach he has to our defense. You know, he can instill confidence in our defense, where last year I think he was focused on what he did for our offense. He can be an overall factor for both sides of the ball this year and, and really help the confidence of the defense. Front row. Coach Eric Bailey with Tulsa World. When Georgia played Oklahoma in the Rose Bowl, uh, all offense, no defense. Brent Venables has turned things around. Can you talk a little bit about the job Brent's doing at Oklahoma and what Oklahoma brings to the SEC now that they joined the league? Yeah, the great traditions, what they bring, uh, tradition, rich history, the, what a tremendous job Brent did at Clemson as a defensive coordinator. And he's, you can see those same elements, those same characteristics of toughness, attacking. Uh, he's going to always be good on defense. He knows defense. He understands how to attack offenses. So as he gets the players he's recruiting more and more in there, they're going to be a dominant defensive football team. And I think that's kind of, you know, SEC has always been known for really good defenses, and he brings a, another one with him. Left side, second row. Coach Davis Baker, WSFA in Montgomery. Uh, out of all the battles you've had with Alabama, you've only, you've only played them once in the regular season, which was COVID year, limit capacity. What's it like preparing to go to a place like Brian Denny that will feel likely like a playoff game? Uh, you know, I'm not going to be dismissive of going to play at Brian Denny. It's hard. But when you play on the road in the SEC, Everywhere is hard. I mean, it is just difficult to play. The passion and energy on road games, people don't – Go ask a veteran, veteran SEC coach about road wins. 
there are only good wins. There are no bad wins. And it's not any different when you go to, to Tuscaloosa. It's a hard place to play. The passion, the energy, the players on the field, huh, they're, all, they're, they're all good. And uh, that's a challenge that we, we kind of embrace that. We love that. We like going on the road. We like being the, 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 the one against the many. And I think you have to embrace it. Right side, third row. Hey, Kirby. Brett McMurphy with Action Network. Um, when you were at Alabama, Nick took some chances on bringing in some assistant coaches that had had some issues in the past. Um, I talked to Lane about it, obviously Sark. Now that he's gone, do you see any current head coaches that will kind of fill that role and maybe bring people in to give them a chance, try to give them a second chance to kind of revitalize their career like Nick did? Yeah, I, I don't know specifically that I can say somebody that would do that, but I think every coach – you know, deserves that opportunity. I mean, um, we're human. We make mistakes. Um, things happen. I mean, people get second chances all the time in, in most professions. So uh, I certainly am glad that Nick did because it, it, it started my relationship with Lane, who I have immense respect for um, and enjoyed getting to know and, and have even enjoyed more. Our relationship has grown since the time we spent at Alabama together. So um, I think it's a good thing, and, and I think Nick started it to say who's going to – carry that torch or, or carry that banner I, I don't know that left side on the aisle coach Carter Yates with Dave Campbell's Texas football now that there's a second Texas University in the SEC does that change the geography of your recruiting process at all no I mean we've recruited Texas for a long time Texas is great high school football we've had a lot of starters that have come to play for us from Texas um, obviously Texas and Texas A&M can't sign all the good football players in this state. They, they, they're they going to go to other places. So it's uh, geographically, it's bigger than the entire SEC. The, the size of it is just humongous. So we're going to continue to recruit it, you know, regardless of two, three, four teams in the league. We only have time for two more questions. We go on the right side on the aisle. Coach Pilly Jones, George Plaster Show, Nashville, Tennessee. I'm curious, one, at Humphreys, you guys add him from Vanderbilt through the portal. Was he a guy you guys ID'd at the high school level or just something that you guys kind of saw as you were scouting Vanderbilt and in that game last year that you thought he could be a contributor? Talk about maybe how you found him and what you think he'll add to the team next year. Yeah, excited about what he can do for us. Uh, wonderful family, you know, two uh, athletes as parents. And um, once he went in the portal, it was an area that we needed some help in. We were losing a lot of wideouts, senior-laden group, and uh, he provides depth at that position, and he's a, a, a really good football player and an excellent person, and we're excited to have him. Final question over here on the left. Hey, Kirby, Zach Klein, Channel 2 in Atlanta. With the iPads now being allowed during games, how will you take advantage of that? Could it be information overload, and what do you hope to get out of that new technology allowed on game days? Yeah, I think quicker feedback to the players. Visually, they see things better than when you draw them up. So I don't know that it'll be as big an asset for coaches as it will be for players. We tend to get good information from up top, our guys that are up top watching it. But getting to show that information to players will be critical. I think the implementation of that is really critical for us as coaches because coaches are not always technologically savvy, and we've got to really practice that to be good at it. A lot of times our players are better um, at doing those things than us, so the implementation of that will be critical. Coach, thank you very much. Good morning. I appreciate you guys coming out. Uh, I do want it to be duly noted that I got in here without a credential today. So it's the first time I've gotten through that uh, door there after the news I heard yesterday. Thanks, Greg. I really appreciate uh, the leadership he provides for us. Um, I've been very fortunate to have nine years. I mean, that is just crazy to think about this is my ninth uh one of these and 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 you know greg has done a tremendous job from every meeting i've ever been in from every issue we've ever dealt with with the ever-changing flow of college sports the guy's incredible in the room with us and i appreciate it and i enjoyed greg's message yesterday about all the other sports in the sec look i am a, a son of the sec i counted 30 years since I went to the University of Georgia in 1994, 25 of the last 30 years I've spent in the SEC. I love bragging about that, and I love bragging about our sports. There's not a sporting event that I don't go to in Athens, Georgia, and watch the highest level of competition in all sports. So a lot of credit goes out to all the other sports in the SEC, and this event is a chance to honor that. And I thought Greg did a great job of that uh, yesterday. 
Um, just had a, a media member hit me with this, and I wanted to share it. Uh, Seth Emerson, one of the national writers, just hit me a few minutes ago. We were talking about uh, the nine years, and uh, he had a great line from the Indiana Jones movie I watched growing up. My brother Carl always loved Indiana Jones, but uh, the great line was, it's not the years, it's the mileage. And I tell you, being an SEC head coach, that's a true statement. It's not the years, it's the mileage. And it's been a great nine-year uh, run for us at Georgia. But I'll start a little bit with my family. Uh, yesterday was the 18th year anniversary of my wife and I, uh, Mary Beth, and uh, we are excited and uh, honored to have spent nine, nine of those 18 years in Athens, Georgia, where both of us were student athletes. Uh, we got to spend that, uh, that, that anniversary in the, the great city of Savannah at Little League Baseball game. So you do what you have to do to spend time with your kids, and we certainly enjoy that. Um, it's my 16-year-old twins, who I like talking about. They're rising juniors now. I don't know geography, and I, I, I don't know how well you guys know geography, but I have one who is in Fiji, and I have one who is in Croatia on trips. And I looked at the globe last night, and it, it's hard for me because I'm a Southeastern Conference baby. I'm not a, a very worldly uh, gentleman, but I have one in Fiji and one in Croatia, and I don't think you could be two further points apart from each other that they are right now. But they're enjoying those trips and uh, getting to kind of develop and further themselves. My wife loves traveling. I don't. And uh, she kind of won up me this year when I had a chance to go with my youngest son to Cooperstown, which Greg mentioned. And I had an unbelievable time in Cooperstown, got to visit the Baseball Hall of Fame and, and uh, play in a lot of baseball games. And then went to Mississippi with my youngest son for a baseball tournament and spent three or four days there. My wife decided to go to Amsterdam and go to Taylor Swift concert. So she is a huge Taylor Swift fan and took my twins there and said, if you're going to go all around the world playing baseball, I'm going to go to Amsterdam and enjoy uh, Taylor Swift, which she's a big fan of. The three guys we got here today, I want to speak on behalf of those guys, but I want to give you a quick story to uh, show you when you know you're getting old, and it got me yesterday. Uh, not to pick on uh, Coach Saban, because I got a lot of kind words to say about him coming up, but you know, I, I always thought that, that like, oh man, Coach Sa I thought I saw him as older when he was coaching, and I saw myself as younger, and now I'm looking at it like, Man, I'm old. I'm riding in the car yesterday with Michael, Malachi, and Carson Beck. We're coming from uh, the airport uh, to the hotel, and, and I'm sharing conversation with Michael and Malachi. And of course, what's everybody talking about yesterday? What's all college football players talking about? NCAA football game, right? The, the new game that's out. And I'm just trying to get in the conversation and talk to them about it. And I said, man, I, I, that game's pretty awesome. And they're like, yeah, I can't wait to get to the hotel, and, and I'm going to play it tonight, and everybody's talking about it. It's all over. It's trending. It's all over everything. And I was like, how do they keep that thing in stores? It's got to sell out. How do they keep it in stores? And Michael and Malachi just fell out laughing. And they're like, Coach, they don't, they don't sell those things in stores anymore. <laughs> they're not in stores. And I, I was so embarrassed. But I, I was glad they got a kick out of that because it made me realize how out of touch uh, I actually am with, with how far things have come. You can just download it and go play. It's that simple. So the stores don't have to keep it. But um, the three guys we brought today, Carson Beck, Malachi Starks, Michael Williams, you know, Carson's parents, uh, Tracy and Chris, done a wonderful job with him. He is a great example of college football. The day and age when you go somewhere and you jump school to school, it's, it's, it's a popular trend. This kid stuck it out. He stuck it out now, and he didn't get the starting job in a tough moment when the starter went down, and he lost the starting job to Stetson Bennett the week of UAB game two years ago, and then said, you know what? I'm sticking with it. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to show resiliency, which is one of our core traits, and he did that. And he, he, he was able to monetize that value as well in form of NIL by staying and succeeding actually where his feet are. But he's a great leader for us. He's a great example of resiliency in college football. Please visit with him today um, as he's one of the leaders of our team. Malachi, uh, you know, he, he, he's such an incredible kid. You know, his, his mom, Tisha, and, and Larry, they do a great job with him. It was a joy recruiting him. He's a local kid. He started for us since day one. 
So all the knocks and all the things said out there about you can't start as a freshman at Georgia, it's too hard to play on defense. The first game he ever was in against Oregon, he started, and he started ever since. He's a quiet, humble leader. Um, he's a very Christian young man, and he represents our university the right way. I'm really proud to have Malachi here today. And then Michael Williams, um, you know, his mom, Shamika, and uh, John are both great people, and, and what a great job they've done with, with Michael. He's, he's become very versatile for us in terms of what he does on the field, but there's no greater value than what he does in that locker room because he works every day. He's physical. He enjoys practice. Uh, he's a great leader for us, and uh, he should be a huge asset for us. But please enjoy those guys um, and visit with them as they're, 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 they're indicative of the locker room we have and great guys to be around. Um, a couple words I want to say to uh, to Coach Saban, who meant so much to me in my career. Um, first of all, the, the 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 words he shared at the ESPYS the other night were incredible, uh, very touching, very moving. Um, but what he's meant to myself, my family, uh, as a mentor, as a, uh, a friend, as a competitor that drives you to get better. You know, there there was never a day in 11 years I worked for him that. We didn't share a room in some sort, whether that was the defensive room, defensive back room, staff room. We didn't share a room in some sort. And I think it made me who I am today because the demand for excellence is met by none other than him. So that standard that he set for me day in and day out, he met himself. And every coach that ever worked with him or for him will tell you that he does it all himself as well. He doesn't hold you uh, to any different standard than he holds himself to. So a lot of the success I've had, I give credit to him and thanks. And uh, I know he'll be critiquing me today. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, but he has started responding to texts. And I told people the other day, I said, that's the first time ever, either somebody's got his phone or he's learned how to text. And that, that makes all of us in his little circle of uh, friends uh, proud because we get to reach out to him. Um, we're dealing with new challenges this year. We don't have a chip on our shoulder in terms of people trying to use that as motivation. I've never used um, a failure from the previous year as motivation, and I've never used the success of a previous year as motivation. We won't do that this year. That's not who we are. Um, we want to recreate ourselves, um, to say, uh, in the best light we can. And this team has been fun to coach. I tell people all the time, we had 15 really tough spring practices, and that includes the spring game. I probably would only trade one of those in and say, could I do it over? That we got a lot out of those. Uh, I enjoy being on the grass with this group. They're fun to be with, uh, have a great locker room. They love each other and they're working their butt off right now. We have four new coaches. That's a new challenge uh, for us. I don't think we've had uh, a situation where we had four new coaches. We have four new coaches coming in. I'm excited about the energy they brought, the buy-in they brought, learning our culture and uh, how we do things at our place. Some have been with us before. Some have been similar places, but I'm really excited about the four new coaches we got. And being able to retain uh, Coach Muschamp was incredible because he's still an integral part of our program. And he's also going to be able to watch his son play uh, for Clark at Vanderbilt. So I'm excited about that. You know, every offseason, we do a study and we try to find something to look outside of football to kind of redefine ourselves and recenter. And it's great for me. You know, I really think it's good to study successful people, whether that's in the sports industry or whether that's in uh, the business industry. And this year, we took Nike, who I've had the great pleasure of meeting uh, Phil Knight and his wonderful wife, Penny. And I wish I could get some of that NIO money that he's sharing with Dan Lanning, but um, that's another note. Uh, but the study of Nike for us has been incredible. I didn't know some of the things about when Nike originated, and we took a week by week look in skull sessions, breakout sessions, as well as together, and studied kind of their model. And uh, one of the first things we studied was the belief of assume nothing. And I think that's so important in football. Because when you, when you assume something or you assume you know someone or you assume that you know somebody's name that you're in the room with, you can take things for granted. It's just like starting over from a previous year. Assume nothing. Assume nothing. Start from ground zero and build this team different than every other team. And Nike did that. Nike followed that. They assumed nothing. Where does a name come from? So if you assume that you know everybody's name, you, you may not know what that name means. We had each player get up in front of the team and say what their first and middle and last name and where that came from. I encourage you, if you've never done that exercise in an organization, do it. Because you learn more about somebody when you know what they got their name from. 
and what it stands for and what it meant in their family, what it meant in their lineage, it's very important. And you get a lot of uh, deep conversations to know somebody better, which when you're on the field with somebody you, you, and you go to battle with somebody out on the field, you better be able to uh, know what their reasoning is. And I really enjoyed that. And I enjoyed our study of Nike as we went through. So with that, I want to be able to be uh, judgmental of you guys' time and answer any questions you have. So I'll open it up from there. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Seth, Diego, or Nolan, we'll get a microphone to you. We do ask that you give your name and affiliation uh, prior to your question. So if we will, we'll start over here, right here on the front row to our left, Coach, in the very front row. Uh, good morning, Coach. Michael Gittins with the War Report. Uh, in this new SEC, uh, Georgia got a pretty tough road draw. You've got Alabama on the road. You've got Texas on the road. You've got Ole Miss on the road. You also have Kentucky on the road. Can you talk about your road schedule and how you're preparing your team for this, this tough 2024 schedule? Yeah, initially I was wondering how I got that draw, you know, but uh, we're not one to complain. We're one to be excited. Um, I think when you step into the shoes of a University of Georgia football player, you accept that that challenge is going to be there. I mean, we, we, we kind of embrace that and we love it. I mean, and what you didn't get to mention is that we open with Clemson too, who's uh, one of the top teams in the pro and top programs in the country. So like, we're really excited about that. I think that motivates our off season so that we have uh, the right kind of uh, approach to the offseason and, and and you know our, our, our guys embrace that I mean as coaches you want to play the best and people forget that when you spent time in the NFL every week was like that so when Texas and Oklahoma came into the conference every schedule was going to get harder it wasn't going to get easier it was going to get harder and uh, we embrace that we look forward to it and uh, excited for the challenge to go to some really tough places okay, coach we'll go right down the center aisle right here on the near aisle uh, Coach Smart, Drew D. Arman, WCCN Radio, Huntsville, Alabama. Much like your mentor Nick Saban, when you compete at the highest level, you do have staff changes. You mentioned the four guys you brought in. What, were you, what was your thoughts on bringing in Traverius Robinson, and what does he bring to your staff? Well, first of all, he has a great pedigree as a player. He played in the SEC, and one of the things you can never really um, justify or explain to people is the culture of the SEC. Number one, recruiting. It's tough, it's hard, it's uh, cutthroat, and you don't have experience in those battles, it's hard to win those battles. He was a really good player. Um, he played for Coach Tuberville, who has a lot of stories about T-Rob and the great job he's done. I've always recruited against him and had respect for him on the road, the way he carries himself, the way he presents himself, uh, the fact he worked for Coach Muschamp. They have a great relationship. Coach Muschamp vouched for him and talked about the great job he's done, and he's brought in a tremendous energy uh, into our secondary, which is a young secondary. And he got the, the, the valuable time that he got to spend over with uh, Coach Saban in Alabama, which is invaluable in terms of knowing how our program operates. So I'm excited to have T-Rob, his family. He's got wonderful uh, family, and I know he's excited to be with us. Coach, we'll go to the section just to your right. Oh, no. Yeah, Coach Brooks Awesome at Dogs Daily. You mentioned that moment, uh, UAB with Carson Beck. And when he reflects on that moment, he thought of it as an opportunity to say, hey, I'm not quite ready for this. I need to continue to develop. Stuck around for a couple more years before he was a starter. Is that a repeatable trait or a common trait maybe you can look for in future athletes that you recruit? of? Because it's important nowadays. Guys leave when they don't have an opportunity to play, but this is a very unique example. Is it something you might be able to replicate in the future? Yeah, I'd love to be able to replicate the DNA he has with which to respond to adversity that way. Like, I, I don't know, you know, as you go recruit a kid, staying power is really important now because I don't think there's a huge difference in the players we recruit. It's a difference when they stay in your program. So the retention is really critical because we think the process we go through of the off-field training, the on-field training, the weight room training, the football training is going to pay off in the years they've been there. Carson's a great example of that. All those years of practice and third down and pressure periods and blitz pickups paid off when he got to start. It's not to say he wasn't ready, UAB. He may have been ready. We felt like Stetson gave us the best chance to win that game, and he played lights out that game and never really looked back after that. Um, who's to say that Carson might not have done the same thing? But he certainly responded the right way, and I wish we could kind of inject a chip and say that every kid had that response, but we know that's not going to be the case. Coach, we'll go back over here to our far left on the front row. 
Hey, Coach, Graham Coffee, DogCentral.com. Uh, when you look at your schedule and the potential of playing 16, 17 games, do you think that will change how you guys manage uh, maybe a lead or trying to get guys out of games earlier? And will it add any importance to the overall strength of your roster? Improve any, what was the ending part of that? The overall strength and depth on your roster, just from one to 85. Playing the schedule we play uh, in improving the strength of the roster, I don't know um, if that's the case. I think the way we go about practicing is critical. I believe in having a physical tough camp. I don't think you back off from that. If you do, it may not matter about those games. If you're not physical enough at the line of scrimmage and you're not tough enough and you don't demand excellence, because during the season there's only so much we can do to create the toughness that we need at the line of scrimmage and the, the toughness we need as an overall football team. Camp is tough. You know, and, and I think that's important that it remains tough. We do have to be smart to stay healthy. We have certain areas of our team that we maybe have more depth than others, and you got to be smart and calculated about the risk you take of losing guys. But um, I think every coach is reflecting right now saying, okay, we may have a longer schedule. We certainly have a tougher schedule. How we play games is play to win. And how we play at the end of the games, if we have leads, we, we've always looking to get guys opportunity and grow players, a la Carson Beck, getting into a lot of games when he was behind Stetson so that they're ready when their opportunity comes. Which will go down the mid aisle, over here on section in front of me, about three quarters of the way back. Hey coach, Raphael Cruz, Dog Time, and Lake Oconee News. You lost three senior leaders in Javon Bullard to Tyke Smith and Kamari Lasseter in the secondary. Who are some of the guys that are stepping in this offseason that you're excited about competing for those starting spots? Yeah, first off, I'll, I'll, I'll correct you there. The, two of those guys were, were actually juniors. They weren't seniors, and that's that's what that's what really gets your program. When you lose two juniors in one room that are excellent players and have been unbelievable kids within our program, and, and they love football. Now, they, they, they came to every practice this spring, and they were getting ready to get drafted, and they were in every practice cheering on guys, coaching guys, the right kind of guys to have uh, around your program. So they're, they're tough losses. Um, we've got some good, young, talented players in the secondary. It's going to be really important they grow up fast. They're going to go against a really high-tempo offense in Clemson to start with. Um, our job is to prepare them. They get to go against a really good offense day in and day out with Carson Beck. So I'm excited about the guys we have in that room, and they'll step up to play. We have some experience at the safety position between Dan and Malachi, but it'll be the nickel position and the depth at those positions that's really critical. Go in the section right to your right, again on the aisle. I'm Bart Richardson, Orange Bloods. Hey, Coach, how do you navigate the world of NIL where you have to participate in it to be competitive, but you also have players who lead with that and they just want to get paid? What are your conversations like with recruits and current players, and how do you navigate it all? Well, I, I think it's a mistake to assume that all players lead with that or that's the primary objective. I think that would be an insult to high school football players and really insult to all people being recruited because I, I don't experience, I don't get to the finish line of official visits where that's the primary objective. If it is, we're probably not getting to that point. We're probably not going to be in the conversation if that's the primary objective. Is that one of the key decision makers? Yes. And should it, should it be? Yes. I'm, I'm happy that these kids get an opportunity to improve their situation or uh, make money and give back to their families or in some cases their communities. So that doesn't bother me at all. I have no problem navigating that. I've gotten less uh, attached and said, you know what, if it's better for that young man because of a financial difference between us and another school, I respect that decision and opinion they have to make. I have to worry about the players that we do get Okay, and I worry about the ones that we do sign that they're the right kind of kids and they're coming for the right reason. That that includes money, but it's not just money. Okay, we'll go down the center aisle and the section in front of me. Oh, John High Fox oh, Seven Austin. Uh, Coach, you mentioned wanting to play the best. You have Texas this year. Do you consider them to be one of the best? And what stands out to to you about them? Every team we play is the best that week. 
please understand that. In the SEC, humility is a week away. I have a ton of respect for Sark and the job he does. We got to watch them play last year against uh, several common opponents. Got to watch them play in the playoffs. They have a tremendous recruiting base. Um, they do a tremendous job in recruiting. Is that, that includes NIL and everything included in that. So they're a big physical team. They're built like an SEC football team. So we're looking forward to an opportunity to come play them and uh, what a tremendous matchup it'll be. It will go over here again to our left, second row. Hey, Coach, Peter Radicus from AO.com. What kind of impact did the Auburn game have on you guys' season last year, and what kind of challenges did that Auburn team and that new staff pose for y'all? Well, let's start with this. Auburn is one of the hardest places to play in the world. And I know that from 25 years of being a common opponent at Georgia and Alabama, when you step in that stadium, you better be laced up, strapped up, and ready to go, regardless of their record, regardless of the expectation, regardless of what the people in Vegas say, you better be ready to play. And uh, I think Hugh does a tremendous job motivating his team. He does a tremendous job in the recruiting asset. And as he gets more and more of his players and his style of play in there, which he got some guys this year, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with but that game helped give us confidence that we could play from behind it also let us know that we're vulnerable in some areas and we had to improve on those so I, I enjoyed playing in that venue I always have it's one of the toughest places to go play which will go straight in front of me the section Kirk uh, <clears throat> excuse me Kirk Bowles from the Houston Chronicle uh, with the 12-team playoff coming up do you do you worry about attrition you know because Two teams will play at least 17 games. And do you think maybe abolishing the conference championship game for all leagues would, would help the matter? You know, I'm not for doing that. I still find value in winning an SEC championship. The unique thing about the career that I've had in coaching, I've almost won as many SEC championships as national championships and I've won two national championships when I didn't win SEC championships as a program. I mean, that, that that's that's unique. I mean, it, it doesn't, it's not supposed to happen that way. So do I worry about attrition in terms of having more games? I worry about attrition having four teams. Okay. Every coach worries about attrition, right? You have to do a good job of maintaining your roster, staying healthy, um, practicing the right way, being smart. Uh, and, and, and I think being a watchdog is part of my job. As I'm not a coordinator anymore. I want to watch the drills we do. I want to see how we practice. I want to make sure we can maintain health. It's hard to do in the SEC, but that's why you get an opportunity to recruit to 85 scholarships so that you have depth. Can you get your younger players ready faster than your opponent is a huge advantage. But no, I don't want to see the conference championship go away because I think it's one of the greatest venues in all of college sports, in all of sports. I mean, the games that we've played in Atlanta have been some of the best, most memorable games that I've ever been a part of. And to take that away, I, I, I think that, that there's going to be teams that look back on that SEC championship, and it's very meaningful. And I don't want to take away from that meaning. All right, we'll go over here on our left, along the aisle. Lawrence Holmes, 670 The Score, Chicago. Kirby, your defenses throughout your whole career have been incredibly innovative. I was wondering, with offenses evolving, do you react to them or do you want them to react to you? And where do you go for the inspiration? Do you go forward or do you go all the way back to the beginning of the game? <laughs> That's a long question that I could spend a lot of time on, you know, and I learned a lot from the defensive guy in the back of the room back there that uh, you're always adapting. You have to adjust to them, but you have to dictate to them as well. If you sit back nowadays and let offenses dictate to you, they can do enough things to, to drive down the field and be explosive and make big plays and score quickly that it can become frustrating. You have to have ways to create negative plays. I think every defensive coach would say that. But I do think looking forward and backwards is really important. You know, we have a, a relatively young defensive coordinator in Glenn Schumann who spends more time on Zooms. He loves talking football. He spends time with NFL coaches, high school coaches. Some of the best ideas we've ever got and defensively came from great high school minds in the state that we were coaching in because they came up with really innovative ideas because they defend these offenses sometimes before we do. And uh, I, I've always been enamored with that in-game adjustment of what we can give a kid or give a defense to help them against something they're doing. You're always reacting, but you do want to dictate at times too by the way you pressure into things you do. 
We'll take one final question in the center aisle, about three quarters of the way back. <clears throat> Coach Joe Gaither, BamaCentral.com. You've played a lot of great games against the University of Alabama in your time. How do you expect the, those matchups to change with, the, with Co Coach Kalen DeBoer in charge? Um, I don't expect them to change. That's two great universities. I mean, you're talking about uh, two teams that have been at the forefront of uh, college football, and it's probably going to be that way uh, for a long time. Both great universities, both committed. The commitment to excellence at both places is really high. The standard that, that, that Coach created there at Alabama and the standard we've created, those two are going to be matching up for a long time, and I think it's what's great about college athletics. Coach, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Kevin.